Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you, depending on what time it is, wherever you are. And thank you for coming to hear this paper on American and French feminism at the International Council of Women. I started thinking about this topic for the first time when I saw this photograph. It's a photograph of some of the most important participants at the very first meeting of the International Council of Women in Washington, D.C. in 1888. The American suffrage activist Susan B. Anthony, who co-organized the conference, thought so highly of this photograph that she kept it over the desk at her home in Rochester. If you look at the original photograph from the Library of Congress, you can see Anthony seated at her desk surrounded by images of her favorite activists from around the world. And the ICW group photo, which is by far the largest of them, is clearly right there on the wall. If you look at the postcard version of the photograph from the University of Rochester Special Collections, you can see that the photo of Anthony at her desk with photos continues to include just a tiny part of the original ICW photo as well. So let's go back to the original photograph so you can take a closer look at greater length. If you focus your attention on the people in the center of the front row, you can see Susan B. Anthony herself just to the left of the fold, and you can also see her co-organizer, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, just to the right. We hear about these two activists a lot here in Rochester. Elizabeth Cady Stanton called the first American Women's Rights Convention in the town of Seneca Falls in 1848, and Seneca Falls is only about an hour's drive away from here today. Susan B. Anthony spent most of her life living in Rochester, and you can still visit her house about 15 minutes away from my office at the Eastman School of Music. We also hear a lot about Susan B. Anthony at the larger University of Rochester, of which Eastman is a part, because Anthony pledged her life insurance policy to help raise the money that convinced an early board of trustees to admit women to our university in 1900. So Anthony's story is a relatively familiar American story, and it's an extremely familiar Rochester story. But of course, I am not an American historian. I am a French historian. When I looked at this photo for the first time myself, I wanted to know who was the woman who was sitting between Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Imagine the joy and curiosity in my French historian's heart and mind when I discovered that this person is a French feminist activist, the Protestant philanthropist Isabelle Beaujolais. Beaujolais volunteered her time with the Oeuvre des Libérés de Saint-Lazare, an organization that worked to support poor women who had been released from the women's prison in Paris. Beaujolais also attended the founding meeting of the International Council of Women in Washington, D.C., as you saw from that photo, the follow-up meeting at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893, and the next meeting after that in London in 1899. She helped organize the Conseil National des Femmes Françaises in Paris in 1901, and she attended the Fourth International Congress of Women as the honorary president of the New French Council in Berlin in 1904. So I have spent many years studying the history of French feminism in France, but seeing Isabelle Bachelot's presence in the front row of this photograph with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton prompted me to wonder how a French feminist had come to be in the United States, how many French feminists had participated in international women's congresses, and how French feminists might have influenced the International Council of Women. Historians of American feminism typically focus on American women's work in the United States. Historians of French feminism typically focus on French women's work in France, but I wanted to know more about the connections between them. Comparative histories of women's movements across the Atlantic and around the world often focus on the famous French delay, the way in which women in the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, and new nations across Eastern Europe all received the vote after World War I, while women in France had to wait to vote until after World War II. What I have found by studying French women's participation in the International Council of Women counters this familiar narrative of French feminist setbacks at home 
by showing us a new story about French women's international influence abroad. French women may have come late to suffrage, but they played an important role in the organization of the International Council of Women from the beginning. Look, for example, at this digest that I have prepared from the minutes of the November 1883 Liverpool meeting, where Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Rachel Foster met with members of the English and Scottish women's movements. You can see that their plans for the new International Women's Suffrage Association that would eventually become the International Council of Women already included not only an American center, three urban English centers, a center for Scotland, and a center for Ireland, but also a center for France. The French suffrage activist Hubertine Auclair, whose name stands at the head of the list of participants in the Center for France, probably needs no introduction for an audience of French historians. But you may like to know how she and Susan B. Anthony came to meet. Anthony visited Europe for the first time in 1883, and even though she was ostensibly on vacation, she also worked hard to make contact with fellow activists wherever she went. Here is the text of the letter that she wrote her fellow suffragist Jane Spofford, who would eventually help host the first meeting of the International Council of Women in Washington, D.C., five years later. My dear Mrs. Spofford, I have just come from a call on Mademoiselle Hubertine Eau Claire, the editor of La Citoyenne. I cannot tell you how I constantly long to be able to speak and understand French. I lose nearly all the pleasure of meeting distinguished people because they are as powerless with my language as I with theirs. We called also on Léon Richet, editor of La Femme. He thinks it is inopportune to demand suffrage for women in France now, when they are yet without their civil rights. I wanted so much to tell him that political power was the greater right, which included the less. Since Anthony did not speak French herself, I am not sure who served as her translator. Regardless of who was there in Paris with her, however, her letter makes it very clear why it was the radical suffrage activist Eau Claire and not the moderate civil rights activist Richet who would become one of the first French participants in the creation of the International Council of Women. Although Eau Claire did not come to Washington DC for the founding meeting herself, she did send a letter about the importance of parliaments of women that Susan B. Anthony read to the assembled members from the podium. When we shall have under our eyes assemblies of women discussing wisely, working a great deal and well, we shall no longer be prevented from sending women into the parliaments of men. The Congress at Washington, in which so much intelligence and nobility will be united, will complete, perfect, and launch this idea of which I have given but an outline. The United States of America will establish the united rights of the human race by causing to triumph for the two sexes equality before the law. Eau Claire makes it sound as if America was the leader and France was the follower, but we can get a more complicated view of the relationship between these two countries at the International Council of Women if we look at the case of the French activist whose appearance with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton I mentioned at the outset of my talk, Isabelle Beaujolais. Isabelle Beaujolais had grown up with another important French feminist activist, Maria de Rem, and she had just become the new director of the Oeuvre des Libérés de Saint-Lazare when she attended the meetings in Washington, D.C., not only as a representative of the Oeuvre, about which she contributed an introductory talk for the section on philanthropies, but also as a representative of the French Women's Union for the Care of the Wounded and as a representative of a French woman suffrage society. Susan B. Anthony chose her to serve as one of the special committee of 15 women from across the United States and Europe who worked together to transform the Washington Congress from an isolated women's event into the first meeting of an ongoing international women's organization. Once this committee had finished its work, Isabel Bajelot took up a prominent new position on the Executive Council of the International Council of Women by serving as its treasurer for the first five years of its existence from 1888 to 1893. 
In addition to serving as the founding treasurer, Isabel Bajalow also contributed to the international work of the International Council of Women in a number of other ways, especially by delivering two significant addresses to their meetings at the World's Congress of Representative Women in Chicago in 1893 and the Fourth International Congress of Women in Berlin in 1904. Bajalow's presentation in Chicago, which featured as the opening speech for the plenary session on the solidarity of human interests, focused on the topic that acting ICW President May Wright Sewell identified as one of the most important subjects on the week's program. Bajalow's presentation in Berlin, which appeared as the second in a series of three invited speeches on the International Evening Panel on Advocacy for Peace and Arbitration, focused on the topic of peace. Bajalow's Chicago and Berlin speeches appeared in prominent locations on their respective council programs. They addressed topics that were especially important for council members. And the fact that council organizers specifically invited Bajalow to speak at these important times and in these high profile places indicates just how important they considered her and her position as a representative of French women to be. Bajalow may have laid down her position as treasurer in 1893 but she clearly remained active and important in the International Council of Women, all the way from its founding in 1888 until at least 1914, when the Executive Council of the ICW that met in Rome named her to a special committee of five members that they charged with the task of producing a definitive history of the organization's early years. French historians and historians of French feminism may know her best as the director of the OEUVRE, and as the honorary president of the Conseil National des Femmes Françaises. But there was clearly always an international dimension to her work as well. Perhaps one of the most dramatic ways in which French women made a difference in the International Council of Women was at the head of some of the council's most important standing committees. For the nine years from 1904 to 1913, for example, Madame Dabadi Darast served as the convener of the Committee on Laws Concerning the Legal Position of Women, and Madame Avril de Santa Croix served as the convener of the committee that started out as the Committee on White Slave Traffic and Equal Moral Standard, and then renamed itself under her direction to take a more racially inclusive approach as the Committee on Equal Moral Standard and Traffic in Women. From 1904 to 1913 then, French women chaired as many standing committees as American women, and French and American women together chaired many more standing committees than anyone else. Because our panel for this conference focuses on the special topic of feminism and sex, I will pay special attention here to the work of Genia Avril de Santa Croix, who started her career as a journalist in 1893 developed an interest in the difficult situations of prisoners and prostitutes when she took a group of foreign delegates to visit the women's prison at Saint-Lazare during the meetings of the Congrès International Féministe in Paris in 1896, started traveling to the meetings of the International Abolitionist Federation in 1898, co-founded the Conseil National des Femmes Françaises with Isabelle Beaujolais and Marie Dabadi Darast in 1901, and started the oeuvre libératrice to provide poor women with alternatives to prostitution in the same year. Avril de Santa Croix participated in the International Council for Women for the first time when she attended the International Congress of Women in London in 1899. While most participants delivered only one paper, she delivered two, one on the economic position of women in journalism for the section on professions, and one on the social necessity for an equal moral standard for men and women for the section on social life. By the time Avril de Santa Croix set out to found, attend the International Congress of Women in Berlin in 1904, she had already co-founded the Conseil National des Femmes Françaises, started serving as its secretary, and founded the Oeuvre Libératrice in Paris in 1901. She distinguished herself in Berlin not only by serving as one of the two official delegates from the new French chapter, but also by presenting talks on two different panels. One on abolitionism in France for the panel on efforts to enhance morality, 
and one on women's unions in France for the panel on professional organizations and cooperative movements. When Avril de Santa Croix attended the Berlin business meetings of the International Council of Women as a delegate for France, she expanded the Council's existing commitment to combating the traffic in women by convincing it to make an additional commitment to the fight against state-recognized and regulated prostitution. The members of the Council also elected her as the first convener of the new Standing Committee on White Slave Traffic and Equal Moral Standard. She was too sick to attend the International Congress of Women in Toronto in 1909 in person. But the written report that she submitted for Danish delegate Emma Gad to present on her behalf was still strong enough to help convince the council to change the name of their standing committee from the Standing Committee on White Slave Traffic and Equal Moral Standard to the more inclusive Standing Committee for the Equal Moral Standard and Against the Traffic in Women. By the time she appeared in person again, this time at the meetings of the ICW in Rome in 1914, she had also taken up a new position as the head of the Section pour l'unité de la morale et la lutte contre le trafic des femmes at the Conseil national des femmes françaises. She had represented the International Council of Women at an anti-trafficking congress in Madrid, and she had been elected to serve as the provisional ICW representative for the new Portuguese National Council of Women. Her war and post-war activities are beyond the scope of this paper, but I should nevertheless mention that she continued to achieve new distinction at both the national and the international level when she was elected vice president of the International Council of Women at the meeting in Norway in 1920, took up an additional position as the new president of the Conseil National des Femmes Françaises in 1922, and started in an influential position on the Permanent Advisory Committee on Traffic in Women and Children at the new League of Nations in the same year. If you go to the website of the International Council of Women today, you will see their ICW logo in the upper right-hand corner. This particular design is based on the design of a pin that the members of the ICW gave Susan B. Anthony in honor of her service at the founding conference in Washington, D.C. in 1888. I'm going to see if I can move my screen down so that you can see the similarity between Susan B. Anthony's original pin, which she's wearing here in a photo with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and the logo at the top of the ICW website today. If you go to the history page, in the About section of the ICW website, you will find that they are actually featuring the same photo that first prompted me to start this project right up there at the top of their page. Their written history focuses on the American side of the story, but Isabel Bojolo still sits there in the center of the front row to remind anyone who knows enough to notice that there is an important French aspect to their founding story as well. What can we learn by looking at the International Council of Women through French historical eyes in this way? One possibility is to look at it as an example of how French women have followed the lead of women in the United States and the United Kingdom. And here I am going to move my screen back up again so that you can see the bottom corner, with all due apologies to Nelly Roussel, whose face I have just covered over. Here is a newspaper article from the French journal Excelsior that asserts that France, like England, has its suffragettes. You can see Hubertine Eau Claire in the top left-hand corner and Genia Avril de Santa Croix in the lower right. Rather than thinking about this as a story of American and British leaders and French followers, however, I am wondering what would happen if we thought of the international story as a story that included important French leaders as well. The vote, no matter how important it was and is, was never an end in itself for Susan B. Anthony, Hubertine Eau Claire, Isabelle Bajolot, Marie Dabadi d'Arast, Genia Avril de Santa Croix, or any of the other women who fought for women's suffrage. In the case of Beaujolais, Dabadi d'Arast, and Avril de Santa Croix, 
the three most important and influential French members of the International Council of Women in the period before the First World War, it has come to seem especially notable to me that they all developed their interest in women's civil and political rights as the result of their overarching interest in improving the difficult situation of poor women who might otherwise have to turn to prostitution for simple survival. Isabelle Bachelot directed the Oeuvre des Libérés de Saint-Lazare as a way of providing better alternatives for women who had been released from prison. Marie Dabadi de Rast, who was the younger sister of the previous director of the Oeuvre des Libérés de Saint-Lazare, served as the Secretary General of the Patronage des Détenus Libérés, which also served female ex-offenders. Genia Avril de Sainte Croix founded the Oeuvre Libératrice in order to provide poor women with the material support they would need in order to avoid turning to registered prostitution as a way of making a living. I started this paper with one image of Isabelle Beaujolais, and as I come to my conclusion, I'd like to show you another. This is a collector's card from Chocolat Guérin Boutrin, and it celebrates Bachelot's work with poor women and her induction into the French Legion of Honor. It is one of a series of 84 cards that celebrate a range of philosophers, inventors, and charitable benefactors that runs all the way from Confucius and Pythagoras to peace activist Frédéric Passy and Republican politician Jules Simon. I especially like the way this popular image of Bachelot asserts that her service to women is a service to humanity. Marie Dabadi de Rast never earned similar honors as a member of the Legion of Honor, but her prison work with women propelled her to a similar leadership position in the International Council of Women, and the international collection of laws that she assembled and analyzed for the section on laws concerning the legal position of women helped propel women's suffrage movements around the world by highlighting what women were and were not yet legally allowed to do in the Council's member nations and beyond. Genia Avril de Santa Croix received recognition not only as a Chevalier of the Legion of Honor in 1920, but also as an Officier of the Legion of Honor in 1932. Her decades of work at the head of the Conseil National des Femmes Françaises, the International Council of Women, and the Permanent Advisory Committee on Traffic in Women and Children at the League of Nations after World War I helped ensure that the International Council of Women would take up a new leadership position through a special relationship with the United Nations after World War II, a relationship that endures to this day, as you can see from the most recent informational flyer that they have posted to their website. I hope this paper demonstrates the important role that French women played in the International Council of Women. I hope it prompts us to think more extensively, not only about how French feminists fought for women's rights at home, but also about how they fought for women's rights abroad. And I hope it gives us a new way of seeing French women's feminist philanthropy as one of the key inspirations for an especially enduring and influential form of women's international feminist activism today. Thank you so much. I look forward to the discussion with all our co-panelists when this posts in July, and I hope you enjoy the Rude Seminar and the Society of French Historical Studies coming live to you from Rochester by way of H. France. Have a great day.